Welcome to our review on enzyme reactions. So the first thing we actually need to understand here is what is an enzyme? So when we're talking about enzymes, we are talking about a type of protein. So they're all made of proteins, which means they're made of these long chains of amino acids. And depending on which amino acid we've got, that's going to determine its final three dimensional shape. So what we actually have as a result of this folding up, if you like, is the fact that every enzyme that we've produced has a unique shape. And the key part of the enzyme that has a unique shape is called the active site, because that is the region that actually joins onto the substrate, which is the thing the enzyme is either going to build up or break down. So the active site has to have a shape that fits the substrate. When we're talking about enzymes, we're referring to something that is a biological catalyst. So all that means is that it's going to speed up chemical reactions in living things. So all catalysts speed up chemical reactions. And because they're a biological catalyst, it's just speeding up those reactions in a living thing. When we think about what enzymes actually do, they will carry out one of two main processes. They're either going to take small molecules and join them together to make a larger one, or it's going to take large molecules and break them down into smaller ones. One key feature about our enzymes that we need to remember is that they are what's called specific. So this means that the active site will only bind with one substrate. And there's a theory called the lock and key hypothesis that explains it. And all that says is that if you think about a lock in your door, then a specific key will fit it. But you can have a whole range of different keys, but only one is going to fit that lock. Same idea with enzymes. You could have a whole range of different substrates, but only one is going to fit the active site. So when that substrate is actually joined to the active site of the enzyme, we've created something called the enzyme substrate complex. Now, what we then find is that something is going to happen. Either it will join these together or it's going to break them down. And then the products are released from the enzyme. And what we find is the enzyme is completely unchanged as a result of this. So that means that the enzyme can then go on to catalyze further reactions. It's not used up in that process at all. There are four key factors that you need to know how they affect the rate at which an enzyme catalyzed reaction will occur. So our factors are temperature, pH, the concentration of the substrate, and the concentration of the enzyme. The first factor we're going to look at is temperature. So on the left hand side there I've given you the typical shape of a graph. Now what we find is it starts off very low at the low temperatures, rate of reaction then increases up to a certain point before dropping off quite rapidly. Now you need to be able to explain what is happening as a result of enzymes with relation to temperature in a graph like this. So the first step of that graph is obviously where we've got the low temperature, which is slowly increasing. So what we see there is as we initially increase the temperature, the rate of reaction also increases. And the reason behind that is that you're giving the particles, so the enzyme, the substrate, etc., energy. And that means that they're going to be moving around faster, which means they're more likely to collide with each other. And the only way that you can actually have a reaction is if the enzyme the and the substrate have actually collided to actually allow them to join. So what we see is because they're moving faster, they're more likely to collide. Therefore, the rate of reaction increases. When you get to that top point of the graph, that's called the optimum temperature. So that's where it's working as fast as possible. If you increase the temperature beyond that point, then what happens is the enzymes become denatured. Now, the word denature means that the temperature has actually broken bonds within the protein, which has led to the active site changing shape. So the substrate and the active site no longer fit together. So that means the rate of reaction is going to drop off very quickly. Do not say that at low temperatures, the enzyme is denatured. It's not denatured at all. It's just not moving quickly. So denaturing is only for the high temperatures. And the optimum temperature in this case is at around 37 degrees Celsius, which probably means that it's an enzyme designed to work inside the human body because each enzyme does have a different optimum temperature depending on where it's designed to work. 
So if you had an enzyme that was designed to be working in some kind of a hot spring, its optimum would be much higher than that. So just bear in mind that optimums will change depending on where the enzyme was designed to work. The second factor we need to consider is pH. Now, we typically get a bell-shaped curve with pH because what we find is you do have an optimum pH, which is where it's actually going to be working at its fastest rate. And that's going to be different depending on where the enzyme is designed to work once more. So if you have an enzyme designed to work in the stomach, its pH would be around about 2 as its optimum. Whereas if it's designed to work in, say, the mouth, then that would be around pH 7 because that's the pH of the location. If you go either too acidic or too alkaline from the optimum, then the enzyme is going to be denatured. And that leads to that really quite rapid drop off in its activity. The third factor to consider is the concentration of the substrate. So this is the thing that's going to join with the enzyme, remember. Now, what we see is initially, as you increase the concentration of substrate, then the rate of reaction will also increase just because the chance of collision between the enzyme and the substrate is going to increase if there's more of them present. But we do hit that point, which is marked with the red X on the diagram there, called the point of saturation. And literally at that point, all of the enzymes are bound to the substrate at any given time. So even if you increase the amount of substrate further, it can't affect the rate of reaction because all the enzymes are working flat out anyway. So you get that plateau or that horizontal line on the graph there. Our fourth and final factor then is the concentration of the enzyme itself. So just like previously, as you increase the concentration of the enzyme, the rate of reaction is going to increase because the chance of those collisions between enzyme and substrate is going to also increase if there's more of them. However, you will get to a point where it's going to level off anyway, because we've actually got a surplus of enzymes compared to the substrate. So obviously, if you've got more enzymes than there are substrate particles, increasing the amount further is going to have no effect on the rate. If you think about the experiments that you could well have done in terms of enzymes in your class and lessons, then a typical one that you may well have done is to actually see the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide using potato, or you could have had liver if your teacher preferred to play with organs. Now, what we've actually got on the left hand side there is a little diagram of the setup of equipment you may well have used. So because we're going to be making gases as the products, then we can collect them in a measuring cylinder. And obviously the amount of gas that we produce will give us an idea of the rate. So a few things that we need to remember that hopefully we know from all of our science lessons over the past few years are some key terms to do with experiments themselves. So when we're talking about a variable, that's anything that could change in the experiment. So it could be the time, the temperature, the amount of something. If we're talking about controlled variables, then these are the ones that we want to keep the same. The independent variable is the one that you are choosing to actually change. So the thing you're actually investigating. And the dependent variable is what we're going to measure as a result of that change. So make sure you know the difference between the dependent, the independent and the controlled variables. If we then went on to calculate the rate of reaction in this particular experiment, you would do the volume of gas divided by the time it took to collect that gas. The other thing you could be asked about in terms of any kind of experiment that you've done on that exam paper is to suggest an improvement. So obviously, if we're doing this experiment here, then what we could do to improve it is that we could use what's called a gas syringe. Now, the reason the gas syringe is better than the upturned measuring cylinder is that we're going to get more precise readings because it usually has a more accurate scale for measuring gas. It also has the added bonus that if you actually did this experiment in class with the little rubber delivery tubes, you probably found that sometimes they just fell out the bottom of the measuring cylinder as well. When it's attached onto a gas syringe, you don't have that problem. So just always think about how could I improve this in terms of accuracy if you're ever asked on the exam to suggest an improvement for a particular practical. And anything making gas, gas syringe is always a good bet. 